Bonjour, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Bellan. I'm the director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, which is known as MISC. And uh, I would like to start by acknowledging that McGill University uh, is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. We do this to acknowledge the importance of the land on which we work, study, and live, and to acknowledge the complex web of relationships of which we are a part. The McGill Institute for the Study of Canada is uh, the Centre for Canadian, Quebec, and Indigenous Studies programs at McGill. MISC supports a multidisciplinary approach uh, to the study of Canada um, by bringing together students, researchers, and practitioners to discuss important issues about the country's past, present, and future. In addition to our academic programs, MISC also hosts public events such as uh, the one you're attending today on a wide range of topics that are important to Canadians. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, today to welcome you to uh, the MISC uh, Econ Lecture for the fall. Normally we have two a year, um, and so this is the fall uh, Econ Lecture. Uh, and I would like to take a minute to thank the Econ family uh, 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 whose support enriches the study of Canada at McGill and makes possible these uh, lectures and the Econ Fellowships more generally. So uh, these Econ Visiting Fellowships uh, uh, in Canadian Studies were established by the Econ family in memory of William R. Econ. The fellowships are awarded each term to active scholars whose research or teaching advances Canadian Studies. MISC is very grateful to the Econ family for the opportunities afforded by these friendships, uh, these fellowships, and friendships too, because it's the same thing in a way. And uh, we have Gail Eakin here, uh, and I would like to thank her personally for her support uh, to MISC. <laughs> this is very special too, because this is the first Eakin lecture in person since the fall of 2019, three years ago. Uh, and so uh, that's also, we should probably applaud for that too. But <laughs> and, um, and we are really happy to be here today uh, with our visiting Econ Fellow uh, at MISC for the, the fall, uh, uh, Kate Podister, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Guelph. Uh, and uh, she, um, of course, uh, is uh, a, a, a political scientist and also uh, she's affiliated with the program in political science, criminal justice, and public policy. Uh, and um, also, wow, justice and legal studies program. So it's a long list <laughs> of programs she's associated with. Also, uh, uh, Dr. Podester holds the PhD from McGill University in the Department of Political Science, and I see some people from the department here today. So Kate, we are really glad to have you uh, 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 this afternoon, I would say evening, because it's probably already dark outside now, uh, um, almost dark, uh, for this uh, um, lecture. And of course, uh, the title is To Serve and Protect Canadian Police Oversight in Practice. Kate, it's all yours. Thank you. <clears throat> so first, I want to thank the Eakin family for supporting my fellowship and making it possible for me to spend this semester at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Second, I want to thank Daniel for that warm introduction and for being a welcome host for tonight. I also want to thank all the folks at MISC for providing excellent support during my fellowship and for making MISC such a welcoming place. Finally, especially, I also want to thank my CANS 402 students for making our class so enjoyable with your enthusiasm and engagement in class. I've never experienced so many students so interested and excited to talk about police service boards, um, which really warms my political scientist heart. So I'm pleased to present today my Eakin lecture, which I've titled To Serve and Protect Canadian Police Oversight and Practice. In 2013, Sammy Yatim, a 19-year-old man, was fatally shot by Toronto police on a Toronto streetcar. Yatim was armed with a knife and was behaving in a manner that was described as unstable, angry, and threatening to other passengers. 
Police arrived on the scene and ordered Yatim to drop his knife, for which he did not comply. Officer James Frasillo fired a total of nine shots into the streetcar and at Yatim, ultimately killing him. Frasillo was charged with second degree murder and attempt murder and was ultimately convicted of attempted murder. He received a sentence of six years incarceration. In sentencing Frasillo, the judge explained, quote, when a police officer has committed a serious crime of violence by breaking the law to which the officer is sworn to uphold, it is the duty of the court to firmly denounce that conduct as an effort to repair and to affirm the trust that must exist between the community and the police. As I will demonstrate in my talk today, when it comes to police oversight, the fact that the officer was charged and ultimately convicted in this case makes this case the exception and not the norm. I want to explain why this is the case, what happens when police break the law, and how the justice system responds. I want to discuss the role of police in society and the context of why these events are deeply troubling. In my talk, I want to highlight how challenging these cases are for our justice system, but I want to also emphasize how important police oversight is for public confidence in the administration of justice and the functioning of the rule of law. Policing in Canada is premised on consent. We agree to some limits on our liberty in exchange for the legal order provided by law enforcement. The founder of modern policing, Sir Robert Peel, provides a very early view of this idea, noting, quote, that the police are the public and the public are the police. In other words, police are members of our community and that they are to operate in service of community goals. In order for this to work, there must be trust between the community and the police, and importantly, their work must be seen as legitimate by the public. Police must depend on public legitimacy for policing by consent to function. Importantly, this relationship is foundational to the rule of law. The police hold the powers of law enforcement and cannot be seen to be above the laws that they enforce. If the police act, or appear to act, outside of the law, it can undermine public trust and erode the rule of law. Confidence in the police can be undermined altogether when the police engage, or appear to engage, in misconduct, impropriety, or criminality. These concerns are more pronounced in communities that experience police brutality, racial profiling, and underprotection from the police, and in particular, black and indigenous communities. Thus, when the police act or appear to act outside of the limits of law, it not only undermines the public's trust, it also undermines the rule of law. As a result, accountability for misconduct and violations of the law is essential, and we attempt to achieve this through police oversight. So how can we hold the police accountable? Police accountability can be both internal and external. Internal accountability comes within police organizations themselves. Here we can think about the chain of command, the fact that officers are supervised by superior officers and can be disciplined by senior officers. There are, of course, also internal affairs units, sometimes called professional standards, that can investigate fellow police officers and lay charges under various police service acts for misconduct and lay charges under the criminal code. All police are subject to internal codes of conduct and provincial policing legislation. There are, of course, organizational benefits to internal methods of oversight. However, the public generally views these methods of oversight with suspicion, and these concerns are even more important for communities that already have a legacy of distrust of the police due to over-policing and under-protection. Simply put, the public lacks the confidence in the ability of police officers to investigate other police officers, believing that the investigations will not be conducted in a fulsome manner and will be subject to pro-police bias. Therefore, methods of external oversight are essential to ensure independence and legitimacy for the public, ultimately serving that important rule of law. External oversight and accountability can come in a variety of forms. There is oversight through the courts and judicial review of civil and criminal matters. First, when we think about criminal matters, when police conduct investigations, gather evidence, and lay criminal charges, their conduct must respect Canadian criminal law and the Constitution. We rely on judges and largely defense counsel to review police conduct for compliance with these limits. For example, if the police have gathered evidence in a manner that infringes rights, perhaps they didn't give the accused the right to call a lawyer following arrest. Courts can review the nature of this rights abuse and exclude the evidence it gathered if admission at trial would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. Second, outside of criminal and constitutional context, courts can be a site for accountability through civil or private law. 
This includes liability for failure to extend a duty of care to victims and accused during investigations. Police can also be found liable for wrongful death, unlawful arrest, among others. Civil litigation has been used to compel police officers to cooperate with oversight agencies. Courts are an important site for oversight because the rulings can create remedies for those who have been harmed and can influence policy change. That said, legal methods of oversight are expensive, slow moving, and only reactionary in nature, meaning the harm has already been caused. Media, of course, also provide an important venue for police oversight. Routine and investigative reporting on police activities is a very important way to hold the police accountable for their actions. When the media picks up its story, it can inform the public and it can result in public pressure on the police to respond to a particular incident or to make a policy change. Finally, governments can hold the police accountable by setting policy and dictating police budgets. Power of the police budget is an important tool to help direct police, police resources in a manner that best aligns with community objectives and goals. However, recently we have several examples of governments demonstrating hesitation in directing the police in any manner. But what I want to focus on for the rest of the lecture is what we call civilian oversight. Civilian oversight is rooted in that concept of policing by consent, meaning the public has a role in providing oversight for the police because the police provide law enforcement and order maintenance on our behalf, on our consent. Civilian-led or civilian boards of review are often regarded as the ideal form of oversight because it avoids instances of police investigating other police, which the public views with skepticism at best or at worst with suspicion, perceptions of bias or illegitimacy. Civilian oversight can take several forms, but successful models will contain independence from political influence, the government, and independence from the police themselves. Independence from the government is crucial because the police represent the state in our daily lives. Therefore, we need independence from the state to promote transparency and to foster public trust. Importantly, civilian oversight provides some independence from police departments themselves, which is vitally important for the integrity of the process and for communities and groups that disproportionately experience police violence. Indeed, the first civilian oversight bodies were created in response to community organizing and community protests in, in response to police violence. Much of my current research uh, and the data that I'm going to present today focuses on the Ontario Special Investigations Unit, which is often just called the SIU. The SIU was created by the Ontario government in response to community organization led by the Black Action Defense Committee in Toronto. The Black Action Defense Committee organized community protest and demand justice for the police killings of two black men. The first was Lester Donaldson, who was killed by Toronto police after being shot point blank range in a rooming house. In this particular case, police were called to respond to a report of a man holding hostages. When they arrived on the scene, it was clear that Donaldson was alone, but he was armed with a knife. Police on the scene say that Donaldson lunged at him with a knife and they responded by shooting and ultimately killing him. The officer in this case was investigated by the Ontario Provincial Police um, and was charged with manslaughter, but he was ultimately acquitted at a jury trial. The second case was the killing of Michael Wade Lawson, a 17-year-old who was shot by two Peel police officers while driving a stolen car. Again, in this case, the officers were charged, but again, they were both also acquitted by a jury. These deaths served as a catalyst for a movement that demanded an end to police investigating police. Following many public protests, of which you're seeing an image on your screen, the Task Force on Race Relations and Policing, the Ontario government established what would eventually become the SIU in 1990. The SIU was the first civilian-led oversight body in Canada and is often considered the gold standard in academic literature because it has important powers to investigate the police. Since the creation of the SIU in 1990, all provinces in Ontario, aside from Prince Edward Island, have an agency tasked with investigating when police are accused of criminal conduct, such as excessive force, sexual assault, or involved in a fatality, though their structure and jurisdiction vary. The SIU is a civilian law enforcement agency, which means it has the power to investigate and lay criminal charges against Ontario police officers. However, none of its investigators are police officers, though some are former police officers, which is a point of contention. Currently, the SIU has 16 lead investigators, 10 of which have never served as a police officer. But employing retired police officers is common in police oversight. 
Other oversight agencies like in Alberta, Newfoundland and Labrador and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick rely on seconded officers, so active serving police officers. Comparatively, the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission for the RCMP is staffed only by civilians, but all of their investigations are conducted by RCMP officers. And the Commissioner of the RCMP has the authority to review all of these investigations, making it, in my opinion, the least independent and the least effective oversight body in Canada. The SIU holds authority over 47 different police forces in Ontario, which is approximately 23,000 police officers. It investigates when an incident results in serious injury, death, allegation of sexual assault, or the discharge of a firearm at a person. Comparatively, oversight bodies in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland and Labrador can, in can investigate instances of intimate partner violence, while the Quebec body has jurisdiction whenever the complainant or victim is Inuit in or First Nation. The SIU can investigate both on and off duty conduct and police services in Ontario have a duty to automatically notify the SIU whenever its jurisdiction is engaged. Because it is a law enforcement agency, it can lay criminal charges against the police, which then results in their prosecution by the Attorney General of Ontario. So how does this work in practice? In a study with my colleague Danielle McNabb at Queen's University, we analyzed SIU investigations over a 15 year period, tracing each investigation through the justice system. During this time period, we found 159 investigations where charges were laid against police officers in Ontario. We found that these charged officers were predominantly male, 97% were male officers, held the rank of de uh, detective or constable at 85%, and had an average of almost 15 year, or 13 years of service. Most often, these incidents took place on duty at 86%. However, when we look at the officers charged with sexual assault, there are some important differences. These officers tend to have a higher policing rank, nearly 30% are at the rank of sergeant or higher, with an average year of service being almost 15 and a half years. Sexual assault cases also frequently occur off duty, and in our study, 44.4% had occurred off duty. Turning our attention to the complainants in general, which could be the victims in these cases, they are frequently male at 63% and young, 64% were under the age of 40. In 41.5% of the cases, the complainant police interaction took place because the complainant was involved in criminal activity. 30% were resisting arrest, while almost 29% were noted as fleeing or being violent. Comparatively, when we look at sexual assault cases, the differences are uh, apparent. Here, the complainants are female and young. Almost 94% of the complainants in these cases are female, and almost 74% are under the age of 30. And these findings correspond to wider trends about sexual assault and sexual violence in Canada, generally speaking. Unfortunately, we were not able to code and track the race of complainants in these cases, because the SIU didn't collect data on the basis of race until about a year ago. So although the SIU doesn't provide much data on the basis of race, we know from an analysis from the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal of just Toronto Police SIU reports that black people are disproportionately uh, the subject and the complainants in SIU investigations into Toronto Police only. So for example, black people make up only 8.8% of Toronto's population, but they comprise 28.8% of use of force cases, 36% of shootings, 61.5% of deadly encounters, and 70% of fatal shootings. At 34.5%, the most common charge for officers in our study was assault. And these cases usually come from what we call use of force incidents. In Canada, police are justified to use as much force as necessary in the execution of their duty, but of course, this is not unlimited. When an officer is charged, it means the officer exceeded the amount of force that is proportionate to the circumstances and necessary for making a lawful arrest, keeping the peace, or to perform other authorized duties. For example, in one case in our study, an officer was dispatched to a drugstore to investigate an alleged assault. Within a minute of arriving on the scene, the officer attempted to arrest the complainant, and CCTV footage recorded the officer shoving the complainant into a fence. This officer was charged with assault because the SIU determined that the use of force by the officer was more than what was required to make the arrest. So these cases tend to happen on duty while the police are responding to a call for service. As you can see, sexual assault is also a common charge. I will say a lot more about sexual assault in particular in a minute. 
So after assault and sexual assault, driving-related incidents are the most common charges, and this includes collisions that have caused serious injury and sometimes death to members of the community. During our study, the SIU only charged officers five times for fatal driving-related incidents. In all, in all driving-related cases, these collisions are most commonly the result of a police chase in which the police or the suspect vehicle hits an innocent bystander or hits other cars that are on the road. Once charged, officers are much less likely than the public to plead guilty. The general public tends to plead guilty at a rate of approximately 90% of all criminal cases that go through our justice system. While in our study, we found that only 16.4% of officers plead guilty. Officers are acquitted by judges and juries in 30% of all cases, but this rate is a little bit higher for assault at 32%. And the acquittal is the most common outcome for officers charged with sexual assault at 43% of sexual assault cases. Compared to the general population, again, only about 3 to 5% of adult cases going through the Canadian justice system result in an acquittal. I want to focus on sexual assault in particular now because these are especially challenging cases for police oversight bodies. There's a significant amount of research that documents the serious difficulties that sexual assault complainants and survivors experience in reporting to the police and the unique challenges of investigating and prosecuting sexual assault. Despite the prevalence of sexual violence in Canadian society, approximately only 5% of sexual assaults are reported to the police. And the most common reasons from complainants and survivors include a perception that they will not be believed, they don't report because they fear poor treatment by criminal justice actors, and they have a lack of confidence that a conviction will result, among other concerns. And research done by other scholars demonstrates that these concerns are valid. Given the significant difficulties in investigating and prosecuting sexual assault in general, these complexities are heightened when the accused or the perpetrator is a police officer. Sexual violence and misconduct are made possible by the nature of police work, which is conducted outside of the public view, without direct supervision from superiors, and often involves contact with vulnerable populations. Because of the authority granted to police officers, victims can be coerced and may believe that their compliance is required and or lack the capacity to refuse. Furthermore, there are also cultural and organizational reasons why sexual violence is particularly pervasive in policing. The culture of policing is founded on traditional norms of masculinity and hypermasculinity, which includes resorting to violence and aggression against those who are viewed as weaker. The nature of police work, which sometimes requires violence, can allow individuals to engage in performances of hypermasculinity as an extension of legitimate police work. But we can see from the graph on the screen that there's been an increase in sexual assaults to the SIU made over time. As you will see, there are two distinct peaks on the screen, which we found coincided with wider social development. The first peak we see is in 2011, and this is when the Slut Walk emerged. Slut Walk was a, motion, a social movement that began in Toronto in the response to a police officer telling a group of university students that, quote, women should avoid dressing like sluts in order to not be victimized, unquote. Protests known as slut walks emerged to protest this victim blaming, slut shaming, and to challenge rape myths. The highest peak in reporting that we see, of course, is in 2017. This coincides with the popularization of the hashtag MeToo movement, and it coincides with the Globe and Mail releasing its groundbreaking unfounded report. This report highlighted the problem of police forces classifying one in four sexual assaults as, quote, unfounded, meaning that there was nothing to investigate. We can see between 2016 and 2017 a sharp increase in the number of sexual assaults reported to the SIU. It is the combinations of these events that we suggest likely encouraged survivors to report their past experiences of police-involved sexual assault. In another study, we examined just sexual assault cases reported to the SIU, and we found 689 reports of sexual assault made between 2005 and 2020. We found that the vast majority of these cases do not result in charges. Over the 15-year period, only 1.59% resulted in a conviction and sentence. During this period of study for the general public, when the police investigated uh, sexual assault in the general public, they laid charges 43% of the time. 
For reports of sexual assault made to the SIU during the same time period, charges were only laid in 7.4% of the time. The next shocking metric is the unfounded rate. Again, this metric refers to the number of reports that were made to the SIU and the agency determined that there was, quote, patently nothing to investigate and do not pursue a full investigation. But we only had data from 2017 because of the SIU. We can see the unfounded rate uh, occurs in nearly 40% of cases, while the Ontario-wide rate at the same time period sits at around 10%. The difference between the two is stark. Turning our attention now to these cases in general. In the small portion of cases that do make it to the sentencing state of the justice system, judges tend to impose harsh sentences for convicted police officers. Because of their knowledge and experience, judges tend to find police officers to be highly morally blameworthy for serious offenses, such as cases where a firearm is used or when the officer's conduct is out of step with policy or training. But on the other hand, judges show concern for what we consider the collateral consequences of sentencing. That is, the other effects that a conviction and sentence will be brought to bear on an individual. Judges are keenly aware that if they impose a sentence of incarceration, the officer will not only lose their job, but they will also likely serve that sentence in solitary confinement, away from other prisoners for their own protection. Judges also consider the impressive records of community service of officers at sentencing. Even if these records are unrelated to the offense at hand and are simply part of the police officer's active duties. Judges have suggested that when police officers have a clean record and a history of helping the community, they are entitled to use these deeds as a metaphorical bank account. They can draw on this bank account, exchange past good behavior for leniency in sentencing. Judges will do this to impose the least punitive sentences possible to allow officers to avoid a criminal record and to maintain their employment. Another challenge is that when officers are being sentenced for an offense that was committed while on duty, some of the offenses only arise because the victim was involved in criminal activity. Here we see judges explicitly note the conduct of, victim, of the victim for the reason for the offense. And the quote on your screen, screen, quote, the victim is largely responsible for why this whole event happened. What happened to him on that night is his responsibility. In this particular case, the judge was sentencing an officer convicted of assault for breaking the ribs of the man he arrested. But comparatively, when dealing with more serious offenses like sexual assault, judges tend to sentence officers to more harsh sentences compared to the general population. This is because for the few cases that make it to the stage of the justice system, the officers are also charged with breach of trust, which is another uh, offense in the criminal code. Judges view this as an extremely aggravating, resulting in a more severe sentence. We do see in these sentencing decisions that judges are concerned about the impact that sentencing a police officer for a criminal offense will have on the public's perception of and confidence in the justice system. They are aware that criminal activities committed by police officers undermine the trust and respect for law enforcement, and the public will be attentive to different treatment of officers, whether this is real or perceived. But in these sentencing decisions, we did not find evidence that judges would consider how this issue of public confidence might turn on the basis of race, gender, or systemic discrimination, among others. While the civilian oversight system can provide real consequences for police misconduct and criminality in some circumstances, there are many challenges for the justice system in responding to these cases that make them distinct from other criminal cases. First, police are criminal justice insiders. They are inherently advantaged given their professional duties. Understanding charter legal rights is central to the daily work of police officers, so they are well positioned to know how to protect their own rights and how to act in a manner that the average person going through our justice system probably cannot. Officers are going to be ex experts in how to protect themselves in interrogations and how to not further incriminate themselves during the investigative process. This is in stark contrast to those who are most vulnerable and likely to experience police violence. Folks that experience violence are likely to have a criminal record, a mental health disability, or struggle with addiction. Police also have extra layers of support compared to the average person going through our justice system. They are supported by well-resourced and powerful policing unions that will shore up public support and assist individual officers. Police officers also tend to have very well-funded defense. We found that police routinely rely on high-profile criminal defense lawyers uh, that specialize in this area of law. 
This can be contrasted with other folks who go through the justice system that lack financial resources to do the same. Second, the circumstances of these cases make them challenging for the justice system. As mentioned, it is often the conduct of the victim that brings the police attention, and that conduct can be criminal in nature. It is difficult for juries to assess if the officer's conduct was reasonable if they are also considering that that officer was likely intervening and attempting to prevent a criminal offense. When prosecutors, judges, and juries are considering credibility, this context will shape their impression of the complainant or victim and of the police officer. In short, police officers are advantaged in these assessments of credibility. This can be a major impediment when we think about sexual assault cases in particular, where other evidence may be lacking. Another complication is that complainants may not understand that they've actually been victimized, particularly when that victimization occurs through what we call routine acts of policing, such as traffic stops, arrests, and searches, where the conduct of the police was actually unjustified or beyond the scope of acceptable procedure. Evidence is often particularly difficult to obtain in these cases because of the nature of police work, isolated and often out of public view. Moreover, and especially with sexual assault, we have to face the issue of the blue wall of silence. The idea that police officers will follow an informal code to protect one another from professional and even criminal consequences. So while we want police officers to be treated like any other criminal defendant going through our justice system, we want fairness and we want respect for the rule of law, the reality is police officers are not like any other defendant going through our justice system. So what does this mean for our oversight system in general? My research demonstrates that the oversight system has a long way to go in terms of transparency and openness with the public. Without providing information to the public about the police oversight system, its process and outcomes, we are doing a disservice to the public who will continue to view the system with skepticism. The public cannot have trust in a system that is not transparent. Public perception of police oversight has been primarily focused on what I would say are bottom line outcomes only focusing on conviction and sentencing without understanding the knowledge, the process, and the context. One important finding in my research is understanding the limited scope of police oversight bodies like the SIU in general. These agencies can only respond once a harm has been caused. Someone has been injured, someone has died, or someone alleges sexual assault. They are only reactionary in nature. Oversight agencies like the SIU have actually a very narrow mandate of determining if the officer's conduct rises to the level of crime. This is an important but very high threshold. This threshold doesn't tell us if perhaps there's a better way for the officer to conduct their job, nor does it address larger issues of policy and procedure. Oversight agencies themselves could provide more adequate response and tracking of cases to create early warning systems, and their powers could be amended so they could review police policies and procedures and make recommendations for best practices. Resources, of course, are important here. When Saskatchewan was being pushed to adopt an SIU-like agency, its Minister of Justice at the time remarked that it was a big undertaking, like creating a province-wide police force. And the reality is he is right. Many police oversight bodies cannot keep up the volume of complaints and have to rely on police officers themselves to investigate these complaints. For many, this compromise undermines the integrity of this system greatly. One of the biggest barriers to police oversight is that the agencies have been not only reluctant to share information with the public, but to engage with communities in an ongoing basis. It's difficult for communities to have confidence in the work of agencies like the SIU if they only see them arriving to conduct investigations that likely don't result in charges. This does not foster trust or confidence. Moreover, we need more information about the nature of police oversight as it relates to race as it is only recently that data regarding the race of the complainant has been tracked by the SIU. The public often doesn't understand how police oversight works and the consequences when an officer is investigated and charged. Without transparency, there can be no legitimacy. But recent events tell us that the public is demanding more information about police oversight and better outcomes from our oversight system. And the image on the screen is in reference to this. This is a picture from when Black Lives Matter protested police presence at the Toronto Pride Parade. Community organizing and protests of police powers forces us to have important conversations about the role of police in our communities and what accountability should follow when the police engage in activities outside of the law and outside of what we view as legitimate. Police accountability is a vitally important part of our justice system and my research suggests that there are many areas for improvement.
It is my hope by sharing this information with you today that we'll have a better understanding of how the system works to better advocate for change. Thank you.